Hello, I'm Peter Bell, and I'm here with Mr. Brian Ostroff of Ariane Phosphate. Hello, Brian. Hello. Very nice to be talking to you. June 7th, 2019, I had the pleasure of going through some of your recent interviews and uh, studying them. Wow, the one with Lobo Tigre is full of good information. Um, thank you for sharing all your insight into phosphate markets. I haven't heard enough about it for years now. Yeah, well, uh, you're welcome, and and certainly I appreciate the interest. But uh, you know, to your point, um, phosphate itself, uh, I, I understand it's it's not overly sexy, and uh, especially when compared to things like precious metals or energy, or you know, of course now all the uh, EV batteries. But uh, at the end of the day, it's it's really what supports life, and and so. Uh, right now, it's probably not getting its its due or or the attention, but I think that uh, that the macro is is pretty compelling, and and the time will come that uh, that people are going to start to care again. Yeah, and the macro on several levels as well, right? There's uh, reading through the notes, um, and and even the call yesterday with Karim. Um, next bull market move, I believe it is there. The, one word I didn't see mentioned, uh, mining m and I don't know if that, if jam that all together in one word right now. Um, it feels like it, right? Um, there's, a, there's a pace and a heartbeat out there in mining m and um, Yeah, well, certainly, you know, it's, it's been a, a while. The, the sector talking all of commodities for, for all of it has not been wonderful when, when compared to, say, the, the more traditional big cap markets or, or even some of the fringe markets like like crypto and cannabis. And yet at, at the end of the day, it, it really is something that, that matters, you know, something for your for your listeners to think about. Can, can they really name anything that uh, hasn't actually been mined or grown? And I think that um, it's it's all wonderful to to look at all of this other stuff, but when it really comes down to brass tacks, it's it's the mining stuff that that matters, and and so that business is going to continue. And when valuations are down where they are, certainly it, it is opportunity you know, for the for the large companies to to expand their footprint, but. Really, I think it's a great opportunity, say, for investors, your listeners, to, to really start to look because for years, um, by and large, this sector has been has been dormant. Yeah, certainly. And sometimes it comes roaring back to life, doesn't it? That it does, and and uh, you know, and it it's just it it happens time and time and time again. Um, you know, it was so obvious, yet no one does it. I mean, these patterns, they, they uh, occur time and time and time again, and investors all the time, I, I swear, I swear, you know, I'll, I'll buy the stuff out of favor and, and sell the, the stuff that, that is ripping higher. But inevitably, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out, and, and it really causes people to, to chase rather than maybe sit back and, and look for the opportunities out there that, that you know, have, have been overlooked and maybe weren't quite as sexy. Um, and, and that's really the time that you should be looking at them and, and buying them. Maybe I'd add one more to FOMO. F -O -G, F -O -J -I, fear of joining in. And I, I do believe that Mr. Market suffers from that one from time to time and i see an example of that potentially you know in the disconnect uh, between ariane equity valuation versus um, potential project valuation right and I, I saw i think i heard mention of a four percent p nav ratio at, at project versus company valuation in one of your interviews there and you know that's a amazing discount <laughs> um, lots of questions, technical financial considerations that come into, you know, assessing the that. Um, but I would point out that I recently encountered a story and a coal project in BC where shares were trading for 50 cents or something like this. And then the company announced a deal um, with, that resulted in a $2 uh, 
distribution of capital. Um, and then, you know, the company was funded beyond that for additional work as well. Um, so what had happened is that they had done a deal on the project value, which was five times, 10 times, some, some multiple of their market cap. And that was a mining M&A deal, uh, coal in British Columbia, believe it or not. Sure. And, it, you know, uh, obviously that's a, that's a great story and, and it really does seem to reward those investors that maybe spend a little bit more time looking at, at the company's fundamentals rather than the company's share price. And these things do happen. And, and certainly with regards to Ariane, the company that I'm the CEO of, I think you have opportunities like that. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, we we traded four percent of our NPV, which is incredibly cheap. But when you layer on things like it is the world's largest greenfield phosphate deposit, it's in a secure jurisdiction. You know, most most phosphate deposits of any magnitude are in the Middle East and and North Africa. Um, so here we are in, in the province of Quebec, so it's safe. We, we make a high purity. We have a collaboration agreement with the First Nations. We have our permits. So it, it's one thing in, in early days to, to sit with these extremely, extremely low valuations because there's still a lot to be proven. And, and with with the level of uncertainty, of course, you, you're going to get these lower valuations. But to see Ariane uh, having gone through all of, of these, um, you know, junctures where you could ultimately kill a project, by not getting its permits or the economics not being robust or what have you. We're through all of that. And and so for this company to still be trading at, at those kinds of valuations for, for a shovel-ready project in, in, a, in a first world country um, is, is amazing to me. It, it really is. For Windermere, I wonder, uh, any big wins before where you have taken a project through a full exploration cycle, uh, as you've done here? Yeah, so um, thanks for mentioning Windermere. Uh, uh, as your, some of your listeners may know, uh, I am a, a partner at Windermere. We, we are a mining fund. We tend to operate um, really more in the, in the realm of, of private equity for small mining companies. We take positions early and, and we do what we can to, to help uh, advance them. And so, um, you know, corporately, what Windermere has tended to do is to move these projects until there's some form of liquidity event. And so, yes, we, we have been successful in, in numerous cases, uh, early days of a company called Exploration Orbit. Um, we were the first institutional investor in, in that name. And uh, that was a, a, a crazy story. Uh, really, it, it shows when you have the, the timing and, and the right sector in, in a market that's looking for that sector, things can, can really go. And, and that was a situation where in the period of, of about a year, the company went from about a $10 million market cap to, to a billion dollar market cap. And, you know, that's, that's just crazy. But um, some, of your, some of your listeners that have been in this game for a long time do understand that when a sector turns, th these things can, can happen. Um, you know, we, we were also very successful in, in a company called Adventure Gold. Uh, again, the first institutional investor in there. We're investors for many years, continued to uh, work with management, move the project forward, and uh, and they were bought out by by Probe. So uh, I'm sure your investors know Probe, decent sized company, and um, and so currently now Ariane is is Windermere's um, largest holding. Uh, I, I refer to it as as our oldest child. We we definitely have a, a few other children in the house, but uh, Ariane is is probably the the most advanced here. Wonderful. 
um, so much to discuss. Thanks for some of the background information there. Appreciate it very much. And to hear you mention the port of Saugany and the North Shore Terminal, was was I correct in understanding, you know, when you said that um, the final permits weren't ours to get, um, alluding to the port undertaking some permitting, what does that, what happened there? Did they really, is there a whole new terminal that's opening or being permitted to open? Sure. So just to um, maybe walk it back a couple of steps, um, one of the things that's kind of fortunate about the Ariane project is is that it has it, it is in an area where a lot of infrastructure already exists. That ultimately can be a, a killer of, of big projects simply because you might be looking at a couple of billion dollars just to see that the roads and the power and water and everything that you'd require um, gets put in be before you even begin to work on the project. Yeah. In the case of, of Ariane's Lacapal project, that infrastructure is by and large there. There's a, a hydroelectric dam that's 30 kilometers away, and we've contracted for our life of mine supply. And there are a couple of large, uh, oversized haul roads that are already there carrying large trucking loads uh, up and down. And, and yes, to your point, um, that road leads down to the Saguenay River. Um, that is a, a big waterway, a lot of ships moving up and down, Rio Tinto ships. Uh, are bringing in their alumina and bauxite along that, that river. And the Port of Saguenay does exist. Currently, all of their loading facilities are on the south shore of the river. For us, we will require a loading facility on the north shore, and, and that did require some permitting. So that was the responsibility of, of the Port of Saguenay, as it is theirs. Um, and back last uh, October, I think it was, they were able to uh, get that permit. So in terms of infrastructure for the project, we are in very good shape. Amazing. Thinking about the Middle East and some of these far-flung locations, uh, one of the benefits I think that people perceive or, or uh, <laughs> may exist, you know, in some of those settings is the ability to play politics a little bit locally and maybe simplify some of the processes of mind development um, on the way in or make it look like they're simplified um, in some of these places where governments may be wanting to encourage, you know, but to look at Quebec, it's, it's not talk. It's the real thing. Like to, just thinking, it's a very stunning thing for me to hear, you know, that this project has been able to coordinate permitting um, from the local port to add a, a, sh a new terminal on the other side of the river. Um, that just demonstrates to me, you know, the strength of Quebec again, and and the fact that it's open for business, getting things done, and if on the up and up from everything I could, you know, right, that is sure much appreciated. I mean, Quebec is. Yeah, C Quebec is is a great mining jurisdiction. Um, this project, I can say, is very important to Quebec. They, they've been very supportive, um, and and understandably so. You're looking at a project that is projected to bring about twelve and a half billion dollars in economic benefit to the region, that region of Quebec, uh, in the first twenty five years. Um, big employment revenue, and in, in fact, just during the construction phase of the of the mine and the facility, it'll generate about two hundred million dollars in employment revenue, and that's just over the first couple of years as it's being built. Um, and of course, it's going to generate big tax revenue. So uh, the government has been very supportive. Uh, they also are an investor in Ariane. Currently, the government of Quebec owns just over 7%. And I can say that working with them ha has, been, has been great, has been great. Wonderful. Lessons learned from lithium in Quebec. Um, any comments on that in the marketing side? 
Not really. Um, for all of it, lithium was never a, a commodity that, that Windermere had uh, involved itself in. And just on, on a personal level, uh, I do know a, a fair amount about a bunch of commodities. However, lithium's not one of them. You know, I, I know that there have definitely been some challenges in, in a couple of projects that, that are ongoing here. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I probably should mention with, with regards to our project, um, so the, the nature of our deposit is, is a hard rock deposit. So um, most, most uh, phosphate deposits are, are actually sedimentary, and uh, with that, there's, there's some challenges in, in the mineralogy and the, the contaminants. Uh, but again, well over 90% of, of the world's phosphate deposits are, are hosted in a, in a sedimentary setting. Ariane has a, a deposit that's igneous. It's a hard rock deposit. These, these types of deposits are extremely rare. Uh, there's maybe a dozen of them operating in the world. But they are able to make a, a very high purity phosphate. Um, but again, it's it's a hard rock mine. It it would be the same as as a, a gold mine or a copper mine, blast, crush, float, and and ship. And so you really aren't going to have any um, anything special in in the way of how you have to process this or or how you would mine it. And and with that, it definitely removes a lot of the uncertainty. Uh, around uh, the project and, and the ability to to produce our phosphate concentrate. Yeah, can I ask about the the shape of the pit? I haven't seen any of the diagrams of it. Sure. So th this is going to be a, an open pit. It, it is quite large. Uh, just to put it in context, uh, today Ariane, including inferred, is is well over a billion tons. Uh, it makes it the world's single largest greenfield phosphate deposit. Uh, as mentioned, it is going to be an open pit. It, it does outcrop right at surface. And in the, you know, tens of years that this will be producing, uh, you're just going to wind up with a, a pit that kind of gets bigger and, and bigger. But <laughs> it does make for very easy mining. Uh, the strip ratio is, is low at, at one to one. And, and as a result of that, we have a very, very competitive uh, um, OPEX and we'll make our product, um, you know, very, very competitive on the world market and, and very profitable to shareholders. Well, and that OPEX advantage could be very interesting again in terms of the macro context Quebec uh, I wonder if you know you can demonstrate an ability to get over the capex hurdle um, which I think is realistic given you know the financial support for mining development in Quebec right um, if you can get over that capex hurdle and demonstrate you know a first launch of a project like this is there room for another one of these billion dollar projects um, hard rock phosphate in Quebec um, well look certainly um, just finding a, a hard rock phosphate deposit in the world is uh, an extremely rare thing as I said uh, today you've got less than less than maybe five six percent of, of the world's total phosphate comes from igneous deposits these hard rock deposits um, they are rare. They do make a, a very high purity phosphate. It doesn't have a lot of the contaminants that you'll find in, in most of these other phosphate deposits, namely radioactive elements and, and heavy metals. Uh, the beauty as well, um, aside from the environmental side of, of things, is that this product because of its premium quality sells at premium prices and so historically uh, a concentrate a phosphate concentrate like ours will will trade at, at over 50 percent higher price than, than that of kind of the standard benchmark phosphate 
and to compare that statement with the fact that you're in the lowest cost decile to those two can you can you speak to those two sure so as as uh work has been done by the banks that are you know reviewing and um in discussions with us about putting together the debt package uh they had brought in uh, independent um consultancy group to basically assess the phosphate market as as a whole globally on on a macro level and then ultimately where does Ariane sit um in in this grand scheme of things and and so on a cash cost basis as you say they they have us in the bottom decile the bottom 10% of all phosphate mines per nutrient value and uh going back to the the igneous mines they they project that we will be the lowest cash cost provider of phosphate from an igneous mine so of course that gives us a great advantage um certainly because the mine is going to be so big we have a lot of torque to the upside but because we are well uh placed on the cost curve we are really in in a good position should uh should markets uh, continue to to hang around at at these levels for a little yeah. while i wondered about that cost curve if it was adjusting in some way um thank you for saying per nutrient value right so you're you're including the fact that this is a premium product um in the statement that this is the lowest decile per cost correct and and so just to expand on that you know today kind of your average grade of of phosphate rock uh is roughly a, a 30% phosphate content um and you by and large get paid for your phosphate content pl- plus a, a a few other aspects but you know by and large that's going to set your yeah. price now in our case we produce a, a 39% and so we will receive a much higher price but also what it means is in essence our cost of production gets amortized over 39% versus say someone else's cost of production gets amortized over 30%. So just to clear up, yes. So per nutrient value, we are projected to be in the bottom 10% cash cost. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, what an interesting cost curve right the, the operating cost for phosphate production globally right sure and and you know that that's kind of one of the things in in terms of say I talked earlier about maybe the excitement around gold or or things like that it's maybe a little easier for investors to get their head around and and one of the reasons is really because you know if if you mine gold in in Siberia or Argentina or Nevada or or British Columbia um that gold is is all the same and and trades at at the same price you know in the case of phosphate um as we've talked about uh depending on the nature of the deposit that's going to change what your final product looks like your your phosphate concentrate and it it's going to change the pricing so um it isn't kind of a a one size fits all um so maybe there is a bit more work that that needs to be done on on the part of investors but again in the, in the case of Ariane you know we do arguably have the the best the purest phosphate concentrate that will be available on the market and you know why does that matter um it matters again of course because of environmental concerns uh and it also matters because although most phosphate does wind up in fertilizer there is a growing amount that winds up in human applications it's it's a preservative in in foods uh, if any of your listeners drink coke they're drinking phosphate um it's in animal feeds it's in detergents toothpastes and and so certainly when you're talking about 
uh, phosphate that is being consumed directly into the human body, you, you do want as, as pure, as clean as, as um, is possible. And so in terms of who winds up being our customer, of course, the fertilizer guys will be customers of ours. But there is this whole other segment in the market, the, the um, kind of high purity players that have obviously expressed a high level of interest in, in um, trying to get some of our product. Wonderful. Thinking about the fact that um, a lot, majority at 85%, I believe was the number you mentioned in conversation with Lobo, that 85% of phosphate production globally was owned by downstream players in the fertilizer space. And to hear about high purity players as kind of a new entrant or, or a growing part of the demand profile globally, very, very significant and, and, Again, being in Canada, uh, it all fits together very nicely. And having freight on board as well, right? You you have global access. Yeah, absolutely, and and you know th these are very interesting points. When you look at the phosphate business, eighty five percent of the world's phosphate mines are owned by the guys who make the downstream product, whether it's the, the fertilizer, or phosphoric acid, or, or what have you. Um, and there are those that do not have, and, and so they have to go out and, and buy the, the phosphate concentrate from third-party suppliers, and by the time it gets shipped and, and what have you, and, and, and you make your product, it's definitely a, a bit of a, a challenge to the economics. What is interesting is if you look into the future, um, the guys who are currently selling that phosphate rock to the guys who don't are expanding their own downstream operations. So if you really look into the future, mm. um, where that number today is 85%, you know, I, I could see that number being 90% integrated in, in the future. Because if you look at what phosphate production is coming on stream over the next few years, Ariane's is really the only one of, of any material size and scope that is independent. The other expansions that, that are projected to come on stream over the next few years are by guys who integrate it themselves. So what that means is um, the places in the world and the companies in the world that are short phosphate concentrate, it's going to be harder and harder for them to get. Um, and, and really, maybe it's not so much that it's going to be harder and harder for them to get, but it's going to be more and more expensive for them to get because the supply of independent phosphate concentrate is going to diminish. And I think that when you look at, at Ariane, that really puts us in, in a pretty attractive place. Yeah, amazing. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. And the biggest question to me is about waiting, right? And and your choice as a management team, an investor team here to have that vision and the lasting power. Uh, any thoughts on, on that? You know, is that a prudent uh, strategy? Would you do it again? <laughs> Things like this. Yeah, so, you know, for, for all of it, Look, to, to a large degree, and particularly in the commodity markets, you know, sometimes it's just where you are in the cycle. And really, what we have seen um, in, in phosphate pricing from 2012 to 2017, prices had declined uh, quite a bit. And in so doing, what it did was, was pretty much kill just about every other phosphate project out there. So if it was a, an exploration or early stage development, um, it probably died. If it was a brownfield expansion, you know, decisions were taken not to expand production given pricing. 
And so Ariane was really the only uh, project that continued to move forward during that period of time. Um, and, you know, as, as the company went and, and accomplished all of its milestones, it, it really did that into an environment where arguably fewer and fewer people cared and, and certainly fewer and fewer investors were paying attention. But, you know, there's a, a, a funny thing, which is the cure to a low commodity price is a low commodity price. So over that kind of five-year stretch of time where – you know, no one was looking to bring on more supply. You still had growing demand. The, the yeah. nice thing about phosphate is demand grows every single year at, at roughly 2%, which means you need an additional 4 to 5 million tons of, of phosphate um, to come on stream uh, each year. And and so you go through a period of 2012 to 2017, there's no increases in supply, no one's really thinking about increase in supply, demand continues to grow, it, it chews up whatever excess supply is out there, and then all of a sudden a 2018 rolls around and the price of phosphate goes up roughly 25%. And now all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, where, where are we going to get this phosphate from? And, and you know, there, there is phosphate out there, but now everyone's scrambling because they're, they're behind the curve. Yeah. And so once again, I think Ariane is, is very well situated in that during that period of time, Ariane continued to advance its project, although – out of the limelight, but continue to advance its project so that today it is in a position to be able to build and and capitalize on kind of that that change point of of the supply demand curve. And it's an example of how long it takes. I go to the you go to real mining conferences and you listen to people from real mining companies and they talk about the years and years and years that go into getting these things ready to go into production. And it's people outside of mining often don't appreciate the timelines um, involved and everything seems to be within normal range from what I can see here, Ariane, um, especially given equity markets having a legendary bear phase and yeah. And and you you mentioned also fertilizer prices being up. Wonderful point in your interview with Lovo there about the positive divergence as well. Um, maybe I'd, I'd read a quote here from it. Logic would dictate that the crop prices go up first and then the farmer has more money. And they can pay more for the fertilizer. What has turned this on its head and really makes me very bullish is that in 2018, fertilizer prices went up, but grain prices didn't. That's something you said, and it's a very good point. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and and uh, again, historically, you, you would tend to see the grain prices move first, um, so that the farmer has more money, and he wants to plant more, and and he'll pay more, and there'll be more demand for for the fertilizer. And in 2018, that just didn't happen. As it is, the the farmer in in 2017 did not have a uh, particularly great year and and yet in 2018 he wound up paying up more for for fertilizer despite his revenues not going up because his grain prices didn't go up and and so to me that that there's something fundamental there now um in the back quarter of 2018 and and maybe the the first quarter of 2019 uh, prices of fertilizer did back off a little bit. Uh, I think most would attribute it to because of of the flooding that that had gone on in in the plains and and uh, that the, the farmer was just unable to apply fertilizer. So you did have a bit of a backup in in inventories, yep. but that's being worked through now, and and I suspect. Um, my my guess, but I, I think that as we kind of head into the, the back half here of, of 2019 and into 2020, we will see a, a resumption 
in the in the uptrend of, of fertilizer prices. Well, and it's almost telling that the prices weren't down more um, in the 2019 turnover there because of the fact that you know higher fertilizer prices in 2018. That's an incentive for all those fertilizer providers to make sure they have product on the shelf for 2019. Then surprise weather hits nasty potential for a whipsaw there back and forth maybe one other thing that i mentioned that lobo said um that he said you mentioned off mic when we talked before that you do have some funders stepped up uh, and they want to see you arrange the offtake deals so that was an interview from a month or so ago and we are we now have seen another offtake deal from you um, this time with a Chinese entity. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, you know, so with regards to, well, I'll, I'll go two steps backward and, and then move forward. So um, again, Ariane, uh, the, our LACA Paul project is is very advanced. You know, it's it's moved forward to the point of discussions with financiers uh, around our our uh, construction financing. And so we've received a very favorable response from a lot of the large debt players and really with uh, an interest in being involved provided that we could uh, get some offtake on on the books, basically our our product under contract. And so in the back quarter of 2018, we were able to sign two offtake agreements and then I guess about six weeks ago now, we also had signed a deal with um, a substantial Indian fertilizer trading company. And, and that's a big deal because today India is the world's largest importer of, of phosphate. And, and so um, aligning ourselves with, with this group we think is, is going to be great in terms of uh, finding markets for our product. Now, um, the, your comment about our, our recent um, corporate news was surrounding an MOU with a, a Chinese group, um, and and so just you know to be clear to your leader uh, to to your to your listeners, um, this is just at the MOU stage. It's, it's now uh, both parties to, to work it towards an agreement. But the idea here is to um, is for this group to get access to the project, um, you know, on on various levels, including, of course, the offtake, in exchange for providing financing for the project itself. Um, so this this is key. We'll we'll see how it plays out. But uh, obviously, if we're successful. In, in putting together this deal, um, both parties will be very happy. Ariane gets the, the financing that it will require to build the mine, and uh, the Chinese will get the phosphate, a good high-quality phosphate that they're looking for. And, and just if, if I may go off on a little bit of a tangent, the Chinese angle is, is very interesting here when it comes to phosphate. Yep. Because um, for all of it, China has been in equilibrium when it comes to phosphate. And so, um, you know, interestingly, uh, a country like that, over a billion people, and to be self sufficient, really, they are one of the few. North America runs a deficit in phosphate. South America runs a deficit in phosphate. Western Europe runs a deficit in phosphate. And and a lot of parts of of Asia run deficits in in phosphate. But to date, that did not include China. What is interesting is a lot of industry analysts now believe that, that China is going to be heading into a deficit. And to me, that's a game changer, right? You've got India at, at over a billion people. They are the world's largest importer. And now you could be looking at another country of, of over a billion people that would have to start to import phosphate. And so just those two countries alone make up about 35% of the world's population. 
And both countries certainly have the means to go and and secure the supply of of this needed commodity. And so I I think the the, uh, agreement that we are working towards with the Chinese, um, of course, look, again, it's it's great for Ariane, but I think also indicates on, on a macro level that you know, phosphate prices, after really being lower to benign over the last five, six years, should probably start to wake up as well. Well, and to say the words resource globalism, right, and to say China has a mandate to invest in the best resource projects around the world. And what you're talking about with Ariane having hard rock um, with no heavy metals, this is... Uh, a safety, a, a product quality thing as well. Um, I've heard you mention blending and, and, and all the downstream stuff that could be going on there. Um, I, were there any numbers with the new Chinese entity of, of what proportion of production they would commit to take? Or I didn't see that. No, n- not as of yet. Uh, I mean, right now we, we have a, a, you know, a, a basic idea in terms of what what they are looking to accomplish if if we are successful in putting together an agreement and and of course what what we're looking for um so we will see how it turns out but you know i i think another takeaway as as you've mentioned is at the end of the day um you know the the chinese are, are looking at world class assets for their needs and and the fact that they've reached out and and have started a conversation with with Ariane i think indicates the the true nature of of what our deposit is and you know i i know that most people who who listen to your your show um they're investors and and so here's the key takeaway from from where I sit, you have a massive disconnect here. On on the one hand, there's the corporate world, the, the fertilizer companies, and I can tell you that when it comes to Ariane, we are regarded as a best of breed. Um, most major fertilizer companies in the world do know who we are. They're aware of our project. Um, you know, they've had various discussions with us on, on different levels. And, you know, I always joke that I, I can walk into a, a fertilizer conference and, you know, if, if the people there don't know me personally, they, they certainly know of Ariane and our lack of Paul deposit. You know, the flip side is I can walk up and down Bay Street and and no one knows Ariane. <laughs> and so um as as well known as we are corporately, uh, you know, we're the exact opposite when when it comes to the investing population. But I'll tell you as a fund manager, that's really where the opportunity is, right? Yeah, you exactly you want right. to see that kind of disconnect. You know, you you have a, a company that has moved forward and and well known and well thought of in their industry, and a stock that's been completely ignored. That's the opportunity. Absolutely. Um, there's a tweet floating around from Ian Castle recently, and he makes precisely that point. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge fund manager, micro cap, nano cap space. And, and he makes that exact point. There's an important food chain in terms of processing of ideas. And and, and I guess by virtue of you guys waiting, and right? It, when you were CEO, was the company ever better known on Bay Street in the past? Um, you know, that, that's, that's a, 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 I'd, I'd say no. Look, in, in mm. early days, um, you know, kind of... 2011, 2012, um, this sector was a, a little bit more widely followed, and there were more firms out there that, that catered to the, the small cap mining space, and, and so Ariane did have a bit of a following. But again, after a five-year bear market and, and a lot of these firms that, that had catered to the, the small cap 
world had, had folded, and and really uh, Ariane became an orphan o- over that period of time. You know, just going back to my earlier point, um, sadly, you know, my experience is after after thirty years in the business is by and large investors do it absolutely backwards. They look at a stock and they watch the stock and based on what the stock is doing, they make a judgment on the company as opposed to really what they should be doing, which is looking at the company and then making a judgment on the stock. But you know what? We we all see it. A stock is going up. A stock is going up. A stock is going up. Oh, it's a great company. It's a great company. It's a great company. But they come to that conclusion because the stock's been going up. And and the flip side, the stock goes down. The stock goes down. The stock goes down. What an yeah. awful company. What awful yeah. management. What you know? <laughs> no one bothers to to actually keep up with the company. And so again. You know, for investors who are willing to take the norm and and turn it on its head, that's really where they will make money over over the the longer term. Yeah, that's wonderful. I heard you mention before an old analyst report on Ariane, um, going back maybe five years, talking when the company had a hundred million dollar market cap and laying out you know some of the key objectives going forward and. Uh, just the fact that you've you've met those right the feasibility study even going back that far the permits now the ports the agreements with the first nations the offtakes and the financing um you've said world's largest greenfield project right best of class um amazing that despite all that the market cap is half of what it was at the time the analyst report was written yeah it's it's truly truly amazing to me and um you know for for people who have who have seen Ariane's corporate presentation in the corporate presentation there there's um you know i i guess if i could only use one uh graphic to to really explain this uh there's a graphic there that that shows our our 5 year share price and you know sadly it goes from the top left to to the bottom right on on this kind of gradual slope downwards but superimposed on that chart is is everything that Ariane had had done every major milestone over the last 5 years and again that's all the things that you've said permitting offtake agreements indian trader deal a uh, couple of of good additions to our board um all, all the way through and you pretty much see that just about every corporate milestone that we've hit you know the stock just kind of continued to sink lower and and today we we sit here at a, at a 50 million dollar canadian market cap for what is arguably um, the best of class project, you know, today if we were in production, e- even at today's prices, you're looking at gross profits annually of of well over 200 million U.S. a year, and so this company has hit the ball out of the park when it comes to corporate milestones. It has done absolutely everything right and and yet as 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 you point out there was an analyst report from 5 years ago uh when the company had a 100 million dollar market cap highlighting that you know if Ariane did it all right these were all the things that it could do and and basically projected a, a 200 million dollar market cap so here we are today having done wow. all of these things and and you know not only do we not have that 200 million dollar market cap you know we don't even have that 100 million dollar market cap that we had at the time and and today we sit at, at a 50 million dollar market cap but the project economics have been demonstrated and uh, with increasing confidence right and and sometimes these little juniors can do a deal based on project value rather than market cap because your counterparty knows what the project's really worth and they need it and they have the capital to make something happen there. And again, to point out all the M&A that's going on in the gold space and, and other areas of mining, things seem to really be heating up 
and I I feel like this is a funding for new projects is more likely <laughs> in the next eighteen months than I would have thought, you know, in, in prior years here recently. A- absolutely, and and just uh, again for your listeners, look when um you know when a company looks to put together their project financing a good portion of it is is going to come in the form of debt and so these guys who provide the debt they they lend money and they expect to get back that money and they expect to make a, a reasonable return for having lent that money they don't look at equity they look at a project they look at something on a project level okay if we lend this money and you build this project what are the economics going to look like what is your free cash flow going to look like and and with that will you be able to pay back my loan and so whether a company has a five million dollar market cap or two hundred million dollar market cap or billion dollar market cap you know the lender to the project is looking at the project now look uh, of course you're going to have to pair up that debt with some equity and uh, depending on on the value of your equity that that's going to uh, determine how much stock you might have to issue but again the bulk of uh, project financing comes in debt and the guys who lend the money look at the project for the project they don't look at the stock. You know, it's funny. I, I've never walked into a banker's office that's been interested in in providing some debt to to Ariane, and they've looked at me and say, "Oh, I see your stock is trading at X, Y, and Z." They they don't do that. They <laughs> they look at the projected cash flows yeah, and yeah. and how secure is it. And again, by being as low as we are on the cost curve, and being in a safe jurisdiction like uh, you know canada um you know the the banks have definitely expressed an interest here and to clarify ariane owns 100 percent equity in the project there's no um, project equity split or, or or project debt facilities that have been created yet or or is there a project like a paul project co does that even exist at this point no, I mean today Ariane is the 100% owner of the Lacapal project. Wonderful. And the corporate side of Ariane, um, how, how are things on all that? It's a whole can of worms to get into, I know, but just uh, to briefly mention it. In in terms of the capital structure, etc. Yeah, and I believe uh, mentioned with Lobo there some a uh, million dollars cash in Treasury, something like that. Um, positive working capital. Um, I would just to clarify things like that. Sure. So um, recently, the Quebec government had made a subsequent investment into Ariane. So they've in, they had uh, invested a million and a half dollars. Um, and so that, that will last for a bit. Uh, and so that is what will continue to, um, move our other discussions forward, uh, where we talk with, you know, potential project lenders. Um, you know, wh- one of the interesting points that, that you just brought up is, do we own 100% of the asset? We do own 100% of the asset. You know, is there the opportunity to maybe do a JV or, you know, get the overall project funding in place by um, maybe giving up part on a project level? So today we're 109 million shares out, basic. Um, if you look at the the holders, Windermere is is roughly, uh, you know, hanging around just under that that 20% level. Um, the Quebec government, as I mentioned, is in the neighborhood of about seven percent, a little over. It, it's also worth mentioning that. I myself am, am a large shareholder. Look, when I say that uh, in my 30 years, this is one of the best things that I've seen, um, you know, it's one thing to say it, but 
you know, I personally, um, between my direct and indirect holdings, I uh, have gone out and I've, I've purchased 3.6 million shares of, of Ariane stock. And, and so, look, uh, I, I do truly believe it when, when I say that I think that this is a mispriced opportunity. So, um, you know, certainly we'll, we'll see how that plays out. But, but from yes. where I sit, um, you know, the, these types of opportunities don't, don't come along that often. <laughs> and from the micro all the way back to the macro again, uh, to hear you say Saudi Arabia is the second largest phosphate player, but they don't sell any phosphate concentrate. Wow. I was very surprised to hear you say that with Lobo. Yeah. And, and again, that, that really, you know, for all of it is the nature of the business. Again, 85% of, of the phosphate mines out there are owned by uh, the guys who make the downstream product. And, um, you know, the, the example I, I give is, you know, it's, it's like a guy who has wool. You know, he would sell the wool to the suit maker for fifty dollars. It cost the suit maker to, you know, maybe twenty five dollars to turn it into a suit, and and he'd sell it to his wholesaler for two seventy five, and and he'd put the two hundred in his pocket. You know, one day the guy with the wool kind of figures it out and says, well, you know, why is the suit maker making all the margin? It's it's really my wool. And all of a sudden, the price of the wool is is now two hundred dollars, and and the guy who's making the suit isn't making the margin. It's the guy with the wool, and and so that's really what the phosphate business is. The the guy with the phosphate rock is is the one who, you know, has the ability to to almost set the price, or he can make his own product, and and so. By so doing, you you capture more margin, and and most most um, businesses are, are really um, in in such a way that that they really do control the mine and and the downstream. Yes, and uh, you know the guys who do have the the extra phosphate concentrate. What they are doing now more and more is looking to expand their own downstream operations. And, and that's why I, I think that it will continue to put a bit of a squeeze on, on the guys who don't have enough of their own phosphate rock. So, again, that's yep. India, that's some companies, some Western companies, and, and now it looks like China as well. Amazing. Headline news coming soon. Uh, Brian Ostroff, Ariane Phosphate, D-A-N on the TSX Venture headquarters in Chicoutimi, Quebec, Canada, the phone number 1-418-549-7316, 418-549-7316. Brian, thank you very much for talking to me today. Thank you, and thank you for the time and the interest. Goodbye.